Why am I running? For a minute, I feel a cloud in my mind. A flurry of things. I can't even say for sure what exactly I'm thinking of. Everything and nothing all at once. I'm still running. For a minute, I forget why. But my heart is in my throat. And my brain is overworking and dying out quickly. What am I doing running through the woods in the dead of night? I stop running. I rest my hands on my knees and I take a deep, painful breath. I ask myself the question again. Why am I running? I try to gather my thoughts. Momentarily, clarity comes to me. I'm in danger. Grave danger. Someone is chasing me. Instinctively, I look behind me. I think I've put a good distance between me and my chaser, but I get back to the run. I feel like I've been running forever. This night does not want to end. My sight becomes blurry as I run. I feel lightheaded. I'm losing track of time and I'm fading in and out of consciousness. But my legs are still working. I'm still running. It's like I'm sleepwalking. Then I wake up confused, finding myself on strange terrains and feeling like several hours have passed and feeling closer to death. Even in the middle of this impending terror, my body still wants to sleep. My spirit is what keeps me on my feet. It's a cold night. The moon is nowhere to be found, even though there are no clouds in the sky. But the night has plenty of light still. Smears of gray light lingers in the sky. The woods look alive and haunting. I can't even remember how I lost my shoes. I don't know if I had taken them off and forgotten them. Or maybe they just flew off my legs while I was running. The forest terrain is unforgiving to my bare feet. My legs bash against small, hard stones and creeping thorns and twigs. I can feel blood trickling to the ground from my feet. Still, I don't stop running. The pain rings up my legs and spreads throughout my body, screaming for me to stop. But I can't. The pain will not kill me. The injuries under my feet could get infected. And yes, I could die from that. But I'd much rather die of infection than be murdered by the horror of my tail. The trees tower greatly above me. They seem to grow faces and look down at me. Some have mournful eyes. Their faces fill me with dread, and the night is dead quiet. My head makes up all manners of sounds to replace the silence. They are grim, ghostly sounds. I hear demonic owls, and I hear roars and hisses of snakes. Insects have been biting me since I ran into these woods. All sorts of insects. I can feel welts building up on my skin where I've been bitten. Dying of a poisonous insect bite is another option for me. It wouldn't be an awful way to die, all things considered. Images of Freddy's death flash in my head. Oh, Freddy. I begin to cry. His death marked the beginning of this nightmare. He was basically my best friend. Now he's just dead. It's difficult to believe someone you've known all your life could just die in a split second before your eyes. Images of Freddy's death flash in my head. It was the first time I looked at death face to face. It took my best friend. It showed no mercy. And now it's coming for me, too. I find that golden resolve again. I will not die tonight. I don't want to. I can't. I'm too young. I have dreams. Freddy did too. But his life ended just like that. His dreams turned to dust. That will not be how my story ends. Oh, Freddy. I begin my run again. stories. My mind draws back to how the night began. It was off to a splendid start. I was nice and cozy because I was cocooned in my boyfriend's arms. His gracefully chiseled face and playboy hair could make a sucker out of any woman. But not me though. But he was crazy about me. Maybe a little too crazy to be honest. But his persistent affection was what won me over. Dorian made reservations at this popular, expensive drive-in theater. We had the theater to ourselves for the whole night. It was just us in our car, watching my favorite movie of all time, on a 16 foot tall screen. And Freddy was making us laugh all night. He was such a clown. It was my 17th birthday. Dorian wanted me to have a special day. His first idea was to throw this big party and make all the popular students in the school attend. But I told him I hated crowds. I told him I wanted it to just be the two of us and Freddy. We were having the night of our lives. The shadow watched us from a safe distance, waiting for a time to strike. When it did strike, it was a fatal blow. Blood smeared, forever staining every birthday memory I have ever made and the ones I am yet to make.
A maddening headache rumbles between my ears. I crawl on the ground a bit and pick myself up and continue the run. At this point, the forest seems to be spinning around me. Or perhaps it is my head that is spinning. I'm developing a fever. Even with the night's cold latching onto my skin, vines twist and turn, long, up high trees and across the grounds. Now and then, I confuse them for snakes and I shriek before clapping my hands over my mouth, realizing I am supposed to be moving quietly. The corners of my eyes catch glints of glowing eyes, nocturnal animals. My heart is pounding dangerously. I've never been subjected to this level of stress before, but then again, never have I ever been chased by a killer. My throat hurts badly. I've been sucking in air through my mouth the whole time. I cry some more, pitying myself. Beside me, I hear a sound from the tree I'm resting on. I slowly turn my head to look, just a hair's length from my face. A long snake has a frog in its mouth. The frog is shaking vigorously and struggling, but its fate has been written. There is no escape for this creature. Somehow, I feel like a similar fate awaits me. It is gruesome to watch the frog struggle for its life. Slowly, I back away from the tree. By the time I notice there is a ditch behind me, it's too late, and I fall, and for the next couple minutes, I'm lost in my memories. During the film, Freddy got out of the car to go take a leak. What are you doing, Freddy? Get in, Dorian said. My head rested on his chest, and I was chewing gum and giving Freddy a vague, funny smile. My ass fell asleep, man. It's been more than an hour. Hey, you're not the only one who's been sitting here for more than an hour, Dorian said. No, but I'm the only one without company. You have Allison. Dorian waved him away with a mutter of, whatever, man. I slowly turned to look at the woods behind me. The trees towered into the dark sky and gave off hypnotic wails as the wind blew through the branches, inviting me with bleak charm, rewarding me off, I couldn't tell. Through the darkness contained by the trees, I couldn't help but feeling there was something watching us. For a moment, I was scared. Then I looked away from the woods and rested my head again on Dorian's sweet chest. I felt safe in his arms. Soon enough, I forgot about whatever fear the woods inspired in me. I forgot about the lurking shadow. Oh, don't be such a baby, Freddy. You have me too. Very funny. Freddy said, and then a sword emerged through his heart. A sword? I thought I was imagining it at first. It was a long, wide sword, with edges that made it clear that the steel was old. It didn't glint like all those splendid swords that great knights used, but not any less efficient. The sword burned smoothly through Freddy like knife cut through butter. Blood splattered out of Freddy's chest and out of his mouth. His blood spilled on my legs, dawning on me the reality of the horror. I screamed. Freddy was dead at once. I stopped screaming and froze in time, wondering if this is really just my imagination. It couldn't possibly be real. It made no sense that Freddy just got butchered before my eyes. A minute ago, we were having fun. I didn't want to believe this tragedy had suddenly fallen upon us, that the night had taken such a gory turn. I was dumbstruck. I watched Freddy's body fall to the ground like a bag of meat. I beheld the killer who came closer to the car, closer to me. I didn't see his face. Just a looming blur because my sight was presently a mess from the shock I just received. Breaths escaped my mouth, shaky and icy, as I awaited quietly, my soul too weak to resist my death. Just as the killer's axe came falling, I felt a hand pull me from behind and drag me out of the car. Come on, Allison! We gotta get out of here! I began to breathe fast. Freddy! Freddy! I kept on calling and asking as if Freddy would answer, but Freddy was no longer. Freddy's gone, Allison! I hoped to God that I had probably fallen asleep in Dorian's arms, in the backseat of his car, and that I was now having a nightmare. This wasn't real. It couldn't be. I cried as I ran with Dorian through the creepy woods. The evil that killed Freddy was chasing after us. As we ran, Dorian said, It's that dirty old beggar. What? I asked. It's that beggar from outside the school. My heart sank. wake up. I'm lying on the ground and slowly recovering my senses. My head hurt, but in a different way this time. It wasn't a headache, 
but like as if I had hit my head on a sharp object. I tried to remember exactly what happened. I fell into what seemed like a ditch, but it was actually a hill. I rolled all the way down the hill and hit my head on a stone. I feel the back of my head, and I feel the wet blood on my fingers. Damn it, Allison. It's the last thing you need. I said under my breath. I struggled to get to my feet. I wonder how long I was passed out. For the next few seconds, I feel numb and unaware of anything. Then I remember I was running. I was running from something. Someone. I turn and look around me. Could it have found me? I wonder. In what direction was I running? I'm confused and terrified. Something catches my eyes. Ahead of me, between the trees, I see a gloomy figure staring at me with smoky, moonlight eyes. I know who it is. Slowly, I step back. The figure begins to emerge from the trees. Death itself. I don't want to wait for it to come out of the light. I turn and run again, but I'm not fast enough. A heavy hit lands on my back. I fall hard to the ground. It's the first time tonight that I'm really seeing his face. He has a thick, gray beard. His hair is medium shaggy gray, which is also dirty and smelly. His clothes are tattered, and the way they stick to his skin, one can assume he has not taken them off in years. He's barefoot. His feet are overly dry and wrinkly. The man is very tall, but lanky, like he hasn't eaten for days. He looks haggard, too, like an angry, hungry, wild animal. The sheer smell oozing from him is enough to kill. I can barely breathe. He comes at me swinging his axe. I keep dragging myself on the ground, evading one deathly strike after the next. The man makes barely any sound as he attacks, just some groaning at the weight of his weapons when he lifts them and strike. The sheer smell is enough to kill. He comes at me swinging his axe. I keep dragging myself on the ground, evading one deathly blow after the next. He lifts his great sword to smite me from the head down. My heart is beating fast. I feel like I am just delaying the inevitable, like the frog I saw earlier. It is me against this vengeful and pitiless man, in this woods, that wants to eat me up. There is no hope. This man will butcher me like he did Freddy. I begin to think about how it's all Dorian's fault. If he had not been such a big jerk, this would not be happening. I begin to wonder about Dorian. At some point, we split up. He said I should keep luring the beggar, that he would circle back and sneak behind him and deal a deathly blow. How long ago was that? Perhaps he tried and failed. I can't help but think that my love is already dead. Fear grips my bones, and despair fills me up. Having evaded all the beggar's attacks, I'm now on the ground, backed up against a tree. The old man walks towards me. It seems that he can sense that I've given up. Then I find myself speaking, and I feel an anger inside of me. Anger directed at this shameless man, who will easily murder a young girl who is young enough to be his grandchild. You find pleasure in killing people like me? You sick old man, I yelled at him. And I started to cry. The man is numb to all of my cries. All that is left is that he delivers the killing strike. I close my eyes and brace for impact. Under my breath, I whisper a word of prayer for my family and Freddy's. I take a deep breath and welcome my death with reluctance and trembling. Then, I hear a sound of quick footfalls. Someone else is running towards us, pushing him away from me. Dorian quickly gets to his feet while the old man still struggles on the ground. He comes to me and pulls me up. <sighs> Are you okay? Can you still run? He says. His breathing is fast, like he's been running for a while, like me. I can't see anything. I'm overjoyed to see him, but I'm also furious, because I know we're in this situation because of him. But I'm too tired, and I fall to my knees. This is all your fault, I say. Freddy's dead because of you, and I'll probably die too. And even if I survive tonight, because of you, my birthday will be the worst day of my life, and it will be a day of sadness for me until the day I die. Dorian says nothing. He looks gentle, ashamed. Somehow I begin to feel bad for coming at him like that, but it was the truth. He did cause all of this when he messed with that beggar. There was an old man that sat on the ground just outside our school gate and collected spare change. That's all he did every day, he was just sit there. He didn't say anything or do anything. And people just came and passed by and gave him their spare change. There's a story surrounding them though, of how he lost his grandson, who was all the family he had. They say his grandson was killed in incidents of bullying. The old man never recovered from the shock of losing his boy. He became unable to do anything by himself, so he took to seeking out change. A couple days before this night, after school that day, Dorian, Freddie, and I, we were walking on the sidewalk. We were going to get some snacks from a nearby shop before Dorian's driver came to pick him up. And then we came across the beggar. Dorian always told me how seeing the beggar really bothered him. He decided to call the old man names, emphasizing that the old man was lazy, a fraud, things like that. 
Then Dorian took all his money. The old man fought back, and Dorian scattered the coins all across the street. The wind came and blew away some of the bills. The old man started to chase after the money. Freddy was laughing the entire time. I didn't enjoy watching Dorian bully that man at all, but I wasn't in the mood to engage him. But I told him to stop what he was doing. Before he stopped, he peed into the beggar's bowl of change. Freddy praised him, saying, I only just shook my head and told Dorian to grow up. The old man looked frail and helpless then. Tonight, he shows his true colors. Menacing. Evil. Dorian annoyed the wrong person. Now I was going to die because of it. Dorian kneels right in front of me and hugs me. He begins to cry on my shoulder. I didn't see that coming. This crying makes me want to cry even more. I've never seen him this emotional. He tightens his arms around me and he groans in pain. I can't help it. I cry more too. I feel his pain. Freddy was like a brother to him. We both lost someone. And he obviously feels worse than I do. <laughs> it's okay. Let's get out of here. We'll live. Both of us. We have to survive this night. His eyes are red with tears. <laughs> You're right. For Freddy. We're so lost. It's possible to keep running here for days without finding any edge of the woods. But we're optimistic. We continue to move. Directionless. Dorian tells me about how he tried to engage the man in a fight after we split. He says the man is way stronger than he looks. He was astounded by the amount of energy the man had. Dorian says he believes that the man used to be in the military. That it was the only explanation. We reach one small lake over the which there is a wooden bridge. When I get to the other end, I turned away from him. As I turn, I find Dorian falling flat on his face. Behind him, I see the old man. He struck Dorian with his sword. I scream. My heart is about to burst. The old man raises his arm, his unforgiving axe in hand. He drops his arm to finish Dorian. I fall to my knees, shocked out of my senses. I don't know how my body is still managing to move. I believe it's a reflex. I run. I'm not thinking, and I think I've gone crazy. I keep running, but I'm not thinking about it. My body's just moving. Heavy breaths escape my mouth. I don't know what's happening anymore, but I keep running. A flurry of thoughts and images flash in my head, but I can't think straight. My chest burns. I'm in pain. Lots of pain. Why am I still running? What's the point? I turn and find the old man striding towards me. I increase my pace. I run up a small hill into a clearing. There's an old barn in the clearing. It looks haunted. Every bone in my body tells me not to enter. I turn to see if the old man is close behind me. I can catch his gaunt figure charging with such malice. I run into the barn and lock it from behind. I need to take a breath and see if I can treat the injury on the back of my head. I think I'm beginning to lose too much blood. When I touch the back of my head, the blood around the injury is increased, and the injury itself feels worse under my fingers. I look around the barn to see if I can find anything to disinfect the wound, at least anything to curb the bleeding. It's dark inside. I squint my eyes to try to trace objects using the dim light from the outside. I find a bottle of rubbing alcohol behind a beam at one corner. I take it and pour it on my hand, around my wound. It stings. I find a piece of small cloth and wrap it around my head to cover the wound. In one corner of the barn, I hear a sound. Slowly, the sound is emanating from a stack of straw bales. My heart is pounding as I walk towards it. Why am I walking towards potential danger? Why do we do this to ourselves? I wonder. Despite my instincts yelling at me to turn around and walk in the opposite direction of the sound and even exit the barn, I continue creeping towards the sound from behind the straw bales. I finally find the source of the noise. A group of cockroaches are gathered around a dead body and they are feasting. I want to puke at the sight of it and then I look again at the body as I think I saw something familiar. I cover my mouth with my hands in dread. My spirit screams in agony. It's Freddy. My god. It's the most heart-wrenching sight. To my left, there's a door. I open the door and enter a small room. The floor is littered with sheets of paper and all sorts of scraps. Then I notice there are photos on the floor. I pick a few up and they contain faces of teenagers like me. Some younger, some older. There are a lot of photos. Among the ones I recognize, there are missing persons that I saw in the paper. And then I find photos of Dorian and me and Freddy too. So the old man is offing bad teenagers. It makes sense. He's avenging his grandson. Bad teenagers took his boy from him. Now he will kill every single one he finds. I collapse and I sigh. I've never been in the face of such great darkness. It is really dark. The realization. Every bone in my body hurts. My face aches. But I steady my breath and I try to find calm. I close my eyes. Oh, the night started so well. This was supposed to be the greatest birthday ever. I still remember what it felt like. My head on Dorian's chest, feeling his heartbeat, taking in his scent. Freddy couldn't stop making us laugh. He was the funniest person on earth, and I loved him. I was the happiest I had ever been that night, and I smiled. And just as soon as I replay every happy moment of the night, the horrifying moments replayed too. I watched Freddy get axed again. I watched Dorian get hacked. I am next. This is where I die. I open my eyes. The old man is right in front of me. There is no expression in his face. Somehow, I feel a shred of pity for him. Somehow, 
He's dead too. He's lost. He's nothing but a mindless ghost with only one purpose, like the angel of death. He raises his sword. I close my eyes, and I will never open them again.